Good morning. My name is John Stotts. I'm director of adult faith formation here at Christ the King in Nashville, Tennessee. Last June, after the murder of George Floyd by four Minneapolis police officers, a number of parishioners gathered on Zoom in a series of weekly sessions to discuss what happened, what keeps happening uh, in our country and how the people of Christ the King must respond. The major outcome of these reflection sessions was the creation of Christ the King's anti-racism ministry, which is a framework for parishioners to create and participate in various grassroots efforts to focus on promoting racial justice issues within our own parish and engaging in ventures in the wider national community. We'll have a town hall meeting uh, on Thursday, March 4th, at the end of the series from 7 to 8.30 p.m. For anyone who's interested in hearing more about our ongoing projects, brainstorming the creation of new projects, um, or finding a way to get involved in the work of anti-racism ministry. One of our projects is designed to create opportunities for this community to better understand the history of racism and white supremacy and how various institutions continue to sustain it despite the work of our better angels. This series is the outcome of this work. I'd like to uh, introduce today's speaker with the words of Black Catholic theologian M. Sean Copeland uh, in her book, In Fleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being. She writes the following. Eucharistic solidarity orients us to the cross of the lynched Jesus of Nazareth where we grasp the enormity of suffering, affliction, and oppression, as well as apprehend our complicity in the suffering, affliction, and oppression of others. Eucharistic solidarity sustains our praxis of discipleship as we stand the ground of injustice in the face of white supremacy, injustice, and domination, take up simplicity in the lure of affluence and comfort, hold on to integrity in the teeth of collusion contest the gravitational pull of the glamour of power and evil. Because that solidarity enfolds us, rather than dismiss others, we act in love. Rather than refuse others, we act, respond in acts of self-sacrifice, committing ourselves to the long labor of creation, to the enfleshment of freedom. Here to reflect on these themes of solidarity, love, faith, and justice is Paige Courtney Barnes, a writer and educator from Nashville, Tennessee. She earned a BA in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame and an MA in teaching from Aquinas College here in town. She currently serves Vanderbilt and Belmont students in campus ministry and trains our catechists in the diocese. Her work may be found on her blog, uh, on uh, the National Catholic Register or the things.com. Her newest book, Sacred Remedy, uh, she wrote an answer to the question, how can you belong to a racist church uh, it's self-published. It can be found on her website, www.blackcatholicprose.com. I have a copy and it's a marvelous resource. Uh, so without further ado, thank you, Paige Courtney, for being willing to share from your wisdom and experience with us today. We're all ears. I actually grew up in Nashville and I, um, and so I still attend my parish where I went to parochial school. However, I do scoot into the 6 p.m. daily mass at Christ the King quite often and oftentimes your 6 p.m. Sunday mass. So um, I know the community and I know that you are a progressive community, which is what is really obviously needed at this time. But as a progressive community, sometimes we have to continuously shift our focus back to Jesus Christ so that we aren't lost in the politics and really aren't lost into despair because there is so much obviously to be done to overcome racism in America. And we know that, that this struggle will be ongoing uh, for decades to come. However, as Catholics, what we can do is really have an immediate influence in our sphere of influence at church and in our church communities. And I wanna talk about how we can do that. And, I, and not to say that our efforts shouldn't center on justice because they should. And I believe that I'm confident that um, with your town hall and with your initiatives, you will have justice minded action points uh, which are needed. However, I believe that we have to fortify that justice with the grace that we receive from the sacraments and from prayer so that it bears fruit in a real charity. And that's what I really wanna discuss this morning. Um, and so, First of all, we want to just make sure that we know our history, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, in terms of Black History and Black History Month, 
I just want to say a little word because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with compensatory history. This idea that even if you're aware, I think it's helpful to have the language to enter into discussion with other people of why we even bother, right, with um, Black History Month. And this exercise of compensatory history is so vital because it's clear that when history was recorded, we didn't record all of the stories and we didn't record them accurately, obviously. So we have to go back. And even in our schools, okay, we say, well, obviously in third grade, I had Black History Month. I learned about it. Okay, I learned about Rosa Parks, right? But did it go any deeper and further than that? And there are so many figures that are omitted and truly there are so many black female figures that many people have never even heard of, right? And so we have to make the time and effort to dig deeper. Along those lines, actually how I want to end this talk today is to point to some black Catholic history that we wanna make sure that we're not ignorant of. Because again, in, in a lot of the circles, it's easy to talk about the secular history, but we have to do our due diligence to know our Catholic history as well, because that is a point of entry to a lot of persons who do, quite frankly, still have hardness of heart. And perhaps the saints or religious figures are the only way that they're going to be motivated to act for racial justice. And so I think that our saints are powerful allies in this fight. And so we'll, we'll move there. But I want to begin with, I'll actually share my screen in one moment. And I wanna begin with talking about a few statistics that I do mention um, in the book that I wrote. And just in general, when I talk about, again, this, this whole concept of compensatory history, we wanna think, okay, where are we right now and how far have we come? And what, have, what ignorance do we have about what has occurred in America and why injustice continues to plague us in America? Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen with you. You might get a sneak peek of a wedding picture there. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I began this um, slideshow with actually an image from the March on Washington. And we wanna make sure that when we think about um, civil rights history, we wanna be very clear about what the goals were because that helps us understand or ask the question, how far have we come or what more do we need to do, right? When we're thinking about the March on Washington, obviously the goal was to secure voting rights or to prevent voter discrimination on the basis of color, but it's more than that. It was also to secure, if you take a look at these um, picket signs that you see in the background, it was to end bias in government legislation in general. It was to secure decent housing. It was obviously to integrate schools. It was all of these concepts were the goals because there are so many levels upon which, if you think about obviously Jim Crow America, there are so many levels upon which black persons in America were second class citizens obviously, and were limited from exercising all the freedoms and rights that we have, should have as Americans. And so we wanna understand where the fight began to see where it has fallen short. And so then I wanna move forward and, and ask that question, how far have we come? When we think about this awakening that we had in the summer of 2020, we don't wanna forget where, um, where really all of this frustration, this sadness and this anger is coming from with the repeated murder um, of black men and women in America and the repeated occurrences of police brutality. Um, and so I did research a couple of statistics just to talk about inequity in general. And then I wanna hone in on um, some of the specific victims um, of police brutality in America. So my statistics are from 2019. And we, we should understand that black persons comprise a little over 13% of our population. And I'm gonna come back to that number because I think it's important to keep in mind when we go back to our Catholic um, context. So if we're thinking about black persons being 13% of the US population, um, we see that over 27% of black adult Americans live below the poverty line. That number shoots up for children. Children always suffer poverty a little bit more um, than adults. So 38% of black children suffer from poverty. And of course, when we think about poverty, that calls to mind again, those goals of civil rights legislation. If black children suffer disproportionate from poverty, 
they are not going to have equal access to education um, or really their basic rights as US citizens, even in the 21st century. And you need to be very mindful of that. 6% of black men are currently incarcerated, um, but 34% are ex-offenders. So we have to think about how does that affect their current status? There are many states that have restrictions on the voting rights of ex-offenders. So this is going to disproportionately affect black men in America. 29% um, of black women are the head of their households, which is more than twice the percentage of other American women. We have to think about the family. Um, again, if black men are then targeted and incarcerated disproportionately, that then puts an undue burden on the women who are then left to take care of the family. So we have to just ask ourselves this question, why do black persons represent a minority of the American population, but bear a majority of social inequity? And so when we, when we see things now, as we fast forward um, right to our current situation, or not even our current situation, but let's then look at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. When we see the murder of Michael Brown, in the summer of 2014. We see the murder of Eric Gardner in the summer of 2014. And we see so many persons who were victims of police brutality, but also we see a certain resistance, right, within our own government to actually reform, right, our police uh, procedures so that there isn't excessive force to the point of death of certain persons, especially disproportionately. And we have to ask ourselves, why is this, why is there such resistance? Why is there such a disconnect? So I'm going to stop sharing that screen and come back to you um, so that we can continue the conversation. So we have to be mindful again of when we think about, okay, civil rights legislation in the 60s, what were the goals? How have we fallen short? And we have to ask ourselves now then, why is there still such resistance? If we, I think number one, if we had a better understanding of our history, it would be hard to deny uh, the injustice and it would be hard to deny that there is a, a desperate need for reform, especially in our criminal justice system and within our police force. And so I, th I think level one of really, again, engaging Black History Month more seriously is making sure that you're not ignorant of civil rights history and then ignorant of what's happening um, presently. The second point that I would like to make then is from this great awakening we have in 2020. So even what we've seen is there are persons who were not social justice minded, who simply watched the news during the summer of 2020 and all of a sudden are ready um, to engage with racism, to be anti-racist, to really overcome this problem that's plaguing our country, right? So then how do we move forward? And this is where I want to then talk about the contribution of our Catholic faith. Because when we, even if we are motivated to uproot racism in society, we have to begin with ourselves and with understanding racism as a sin. And it's a personal sin first and a social sin second. And so we can't be, we have to be humble enough to do our own examination of conscience to say, okay, maybe I don't want to overtly be racist, but do I have racist mindsets and ideals that I've simply absorbed from living in a biased society? And I think that it's hard, um, it's really hard to not absorb the bias of our society, even if you don't want to maliciously. And so let's see some examples of that, especially in our own Catholic church. I think that we have to be a little bit more honest about some of the apathy. Um, I think that is present, especially in the Southern Catholic church. So I wanna go back to that number that I stated for you that black persons are 13% of the US population. So we have to think about our church community. Ideally, our church community should be 13% black. And it should be, and we should have all of actually persons of color represented proportionately, Hispanic persons, Asian persons. Um, and, and what we actually see is because of, again, going back to history there and history in the South, there have obviously been obstacles to evangelization, especially with black Americans. 
And so I actually want to go ahead and mention a resource. Um, you could either take a screenshot or visit my website. This book is on my website. But if you haven't read Cyprian Davis and Black Catholics in the United States, um, this book needs to be at the top of your reading list. Um, Cyprian Davis um, is a Benedictine monk who did um, excellent research on, he actually traced the history of the development of churches in America post reconstruction all the way to the 20th century. And he does an excellent job identifying the obstacles uh, of why there were so few um, emancipated black persons who would then come into the black church and why actually Protestant churches were a more natural fit um, for freed slaves. And so if we look at the history of what happened in America, we have to understand that if there were obstacles to evangelization of black persons, then, then we still have um, obstacles present day that are the result of that. And so we have to have a more concerted effort to go back and compensate for that lack. And I believe that we have a duty to do so. And step one is just, okay, when we go to church, um, do we even notice that persons of color are absent? And if we don't, that's problematic. Um, and we have to ask in our schools, in our schools, are, are persons of color represented? And if not, you know, what efforts can we make to that? And I think that is step one of removing the apathy because part of this problem in America of having especially black persons as second class citizens of overcoming segregation, we have to understand again, historically speaking, black persons have been relegated to um, places where we cannot be seen. Right. And so if we continue that, um, even in our church communities, then we're no different than secular organizations that continue to um, perpetrate uh, bias and prejudice against black persons. So I think level one in our church is that we have to remove apathy by trying to have our representation of church more closely match the representation of the American population. Um, and then step two, I want to just speak to the hardness of heart that is present um, in a lot of, unfortunately, Catholic circles. I think that if you were on social media at all <laughs> this summer, um, you noticed that there, there was great division. Um, in, in some ways, there was cause for celebration because, again, many people who were not aware of the reality and the staggering impact of racism um, all of a sudden were aware. However, there were other persons who felt threatened by any sort of action to be taken against racism. And we, and we have to acknowledge that. And, and really to call out that kind of elephant in the room was this camp and this line in the sand that was drawn to say that you either support the police or you sort, support black persons, but you can't support both. And obviously that's a false dichotomy and it's simply not true. And so what I would encourage then as Catholics and progressive Catholics in your circles is the burden cannot be on black persons alone to communicate um, that, that there's no place for resistance here, right? And so where we have powerful allies in our church community is when you on social media then speak up when you see these, um, when you see persons speaking about black or blue lives matter in opposition to like black lives matter, right? Like we can all be supportive of our police as we should be, but are there enough allies of European descent who are communicating this message that that's a false dichotomy and that every single person benefits from reform of our police system and every single person benefits from rooting out racism in our society. We have to have these refrains on the tip of our tongue that we can communicate either in person or on social media so that black persons aren't bearing this burden alone. A concept that I wanna help um, kind of further this point is the work of W.E.B. Du Bois is very, very helpful to understand in, in this context. Um, hopefully you're aware that W.E.B. Du Bois was uh, the founder of the NAACP, but he did a lot of work to bring to light the psychological weight of racism on Black persons. And if you're not aware of that weight, 
um, I believe that you, you really have a responsibility to do a little research and uncover. Um, and, and part of what Du Bois talks about is that um, when Black persons um, have to, on our own, communicate all the injustice that, that we suffer, and then find the solutions also on our own, it's a double weight, right? And so what we really need are just to have allies as society to really communicate over and over again that this is to the benefit of America that we all root out this problem and that we should also be very concerned about the fact that Black persons are constantly um, having to deal with anxiety and stress for having to deal with this issue in isolation. And so the Souls of Black Folk chapter one is probably the best resource to really read, um, dive deep into that concept. And actually chapter one of that entire book is written as an essay that you could read independently. And so um, if you're looking for additional resources, and I do have a resource page at the end of the PowerPoint, um, I would really highly recommend um, that you utilize that essay as a Black history resource. Okay, and now I want to talk um, more, I want to pivot back to justice and then get into the concept of mercy and how actually grace and the sacraments can inform this discussion. So I'm going to bring back up the PowerPoint. Okay, so we were talking about how far we have come and, and how much more work there is to do. Um, and so really, when again, in our Catholic context, we have to think about with any justice issue in the eyes of faith, we want to be mindful that we're familiar with our corporal and spiritual works of mercy, most of which are born of, um, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, when Jesus, again, has that self-identification with those persons who suffer. That's really how we began this conversation. This idea that as we desecrate um, black bodies in America, we really inflict injury on the body of Christ. And so not only do we need to be dedicated to justice, but we need to be dedicated to healing those wounds because we really cannot move forward until we have some profound healing in our society. And so one of the ways to heal wounds is to, to actually engage physically for the needs of the body, and that's the corporal works of mercy. Um, and, and not just in terms of, of thinking about, yes, there are, for instance, we were mentioning poverty in black communities and feeding the hungry. Well, let's not keep it on the surface level. What, what that, how do we apply that to remedying inequity in black communities? We need to then be dedicated to solutions of reducing poverty in black communities. And so we want to engage a little bit more deeply and see how we can apply the corporal works of mercy to specific inequities that in impact black communities. I want to also point to visit the imprisoned. Um, there actually is a very vibrant prison ministry in our diocese, and that's something that you could easily get tapped into of visiting persons in prison who are then, again, think about this concept of how our society wants to erase Black persons by putting them out of view. And so we bring Christ and solidarity and comfort and healing to Black persons by simply visiting people who are in prison. But I also want to point to the spiritual works as well. Um, we have to be, again, very focused on racism as sin. And we want to root out the sin by, first of all, calling to light um, really the gaps in people's understanding, the culpable ignorance that people suffer. And so I, that is one application of instructing the ignorant. We also want to be praying and dedicate, dedicating specific prayer to the end of racism. And, and that's one way that we can, again, pray for all the living and all the dead, all of our ancestors who have suffered, all of the persons who have been murdered in recent memory, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery. Are we praying for their souls? Have we just watched the news and then prayed in abstract, or are we praying by name for the souls of persons who were victims 
of these crimes. And, and that is something that obviously would be very dear um, to the heart of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus would grant us a special grace for remembering those names in prayer. So another thing I wanna mention as we're talking about works of mercy and our Catholic um, black history is I want to make sure that we're mindful of black Catholic saints. And I'm actually going to um, scoot forward the slideshow a little bit um, because I want to go ahead and share that resource page. Um, if you want to go ahead and take a screenshot on my personal website, blackcatholicpros.com, I have a list um, of some of the most popular. Actually, we don't even have our Black Catholic saints yet. <laughs> I hope you're aware of that. But we have a lot of um, servants of God that and per holy persons that we can pray for their canonization, right? And if you aren't doing that, I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, I would also point to, I have some profiles um, in the prayer book that I wrote, and I want to really highlight actually Mother Mary Lang. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a little bit um, and we're gonna pray her prayer um, in a minute. I'll come back to this slide, but I just want to talk about her life for a moment. Um, Mother Mary Lang, her cause for canonization um, is currently underway, and she is actually a 19th century figure um, who was kind of like a Black Mother Teresa, honestly. She started the Oblate Sisters of Providence. She was one of the foundresses, and she was just very dedicated to living a life of not only chastity um, and giving herself to Jesus, but to taking care of the needs of all those forgotten persons in society. She went for the orphans, for the widows, for the people who um, society wanted to push to the margins, right? And so if you're not familiar with Mother Mary Lang, um, I would encourage you again to take a screenshot and, and do your, your due diligence, do some research, Google her cause, read about her life. These are the persons that we need to be talking about in Catholic circles. Um, most people are familiar with, hopefully, um, Augustus Tolton, the first black priest that we know of who um, was ordained actually in Rome because we didn't ordain him in America because of the color of his skin. But I believe we have to supplement. We always tend um, to go towards really almost forgetting oftentimes our black female counterparts as well. And Mother Mary Lang, um, I think is a perfect compliment to Father Augustus Tolton because she was truly one of the first persons to start an order for women religious of color. And she has a great legacy because of that. Um, and now that I am on this slide, I, I wanna read you this quote from W.E.B. Du Bois to kind of um, emphasize this point I've been making about how we really have to speak about and think about race as a problem that we have to have our allies of European descent really engage with this problem so that both, or not just both races, but really obviously all races um, in our country can have a greater sense of solidarity. So Du Bois wrote, and this is from the first chapter, The Souls of Black Folk. The ideal of human brotherhood is gained through the unifying ideal of race. And it's this ideal of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro not in opposition to or contempt for other races, but in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic, in order that someday on American soil, two world races may give to each other those characteristics both so sadly lack. And so I'm gonna come back to you to, to just continue that discussion. I think really one of the most powerful tools of our Catholic faith is actually changing the conversation about race. You know, it's so easy to fall into despair when we talk about race. Okay, we've talked about the problems, we've talked about the staggering statistics, but we also know that um, we're not civil rights lawyers. Well, maybe some of you are out there, but I'm not, right? So there's, in a sense, there are really larger solutions that are needed, and so it can be discouraging in a sense when we think about, okay, what's our contribution um, to, to really bringing about change in America? But in terms of our Catholic faith, 
what we have to understand is we can even shift this conversation about race so that it is no longer viewed with such bitterness and resentment in our country. And that was part of the work with W.E.B. Du Bois was he actually spoke a great deal about race pride. And we can correct that concept of race pride, right? Race pride does not mean white supremacy. Race pride means that black persons should be proud of being black. Why? Because God made us black. Hispanic persons should be proud of being, and Latino persons should be proud of being brown. Why? Because God made them brown, right? So like there are gifts that our culture has that are associated with race and culture. And those are erased in the conversation too. And just think about obviously in the seventies, it was that great motto, you know, black is beautiful that we've even lost. And so we have to then bring that back to the forefront in terms of our faith. How is that played out in our faith? Well, what do we have? We have European saints. We need our black saints, right? So that we can see the charisms and the gifts that were given to that culture. We need more of our Hispanic and our Latino saints. We need more of our Asian saints. Why? Because God obviously created race. Why? To actually um, show us that he's not going to give any one culture all the gifts. And if we're really going to combat white supremacy, what we really have to demonstrate is persons of European descent are not the only gifted persons in society, right? And we know that. And so how do we demonstrate that, especially in a Catholic concept, is through our saints. And I think we need to be much more serious about being allied to our saints, praying about our saints and bringing that to the forefront of the conversation, because it's also a powerful tool against hardness of heart. We all know, and we probably all have friends who are conservative Catholics who don't even want to talk about race, right? And, but they will talk about saints. And so this is a powerful tool of engagement because no one is going to argue about praying for saints. And that's where God can actually chip away at hardness of heart because we can't do it. And argumentation won't do it, but grace and prayer will 100% do it. Um, and so I just really want to place emphasis on this concept that, that I've gleaned from reading Du Bois, that there's actually a positive race pride and it is not supremacy and it has to do with really reclaiming the gifts that God has given to every culture. And so kind of along those lines too, um, I just want to end with this concept of, okay, so how does our Catholic faith empower us to bring about real change um, with this sin of racism, right? And so I already mentioned grace and the the power of grace and the sacraments. And so step one is I also think within our sphere of influence, we have to be prayer warriors in our anti-racism. And I think um, one way to do that, it just very simply, if you are a member of a Lenten Bible study, if you um, lead in any sort of way, a Catholic group, make sure that your racism is um, something that your group is praying against. You know, I. I love the work of Gloria Purvis. I hope you, you guys are familiar with her work. One thing that she says is um, obviously sometimes um, some Catholics <laughs> have trouble walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? Like when we're talking about um, Catholic activism, sometimes there the pendulum swings too far and the only thing anyone wants to talk about is abortion. Right, And so Gloria Purvis does an excellent job of saying, we can actually pray for the unborn and against racism. There's no reason why we can't pray for both. And I think we really need to communicate that message over and over again. We're not trying to erase any other um, important endeavor in our church, but we 100% have to pray with urgency for this issue. And if we're not, then we're actually culpable of inaction. And so we really have to communicate that in our sphere of influence. Um, another thing I think that we really need to do is just communicate this, again, what we began with, this radical conformity to Jesus Christ involves um, healing of the wounds inflicted against the body of Christ. And we can't talk enough about the healing that needs to happen. When we have conversations about race in America, there is so much pain still because the wound is continuously reopened. 
And we see that this summer. It's like the moment that especially Black persons feel like maybe a little bit of progress has been made, then we see another news story and we feel alone and we feel like maybe this is a, the progress is not happening the way that we would want. And so the way to heal that wound is through solidarity and through prayer. But I think that's something that society cannot and is not talking about is the healing that has to take place before any real concept of charity happens. Because what it, what it really takes to bring about justice is a desire to have justice for persons who don't look like you. And charity is the catalyst for that. And so I think we just have to exhaust ourselves praying because I, I think that, and the sad part about this whole issue is that for those of us who love Jesus and are members of his church, somehow we still forget to pray zealously and ardently about this. And I, and I think there is, um, there's need for work there, to be frank. And so I firmly believe, first of all, what did Jesus himself say? What father, you know, gives their child a stone when they ask for bread? If we pray to God very seriously, to bring about change and healing from racism, he's not going to deny us. The question is, have we prayed? And I believe that we have to be very, very serious about bringing that to our prayer regimen. So um, to that end, I, I would like to, in my formal presentation by bringing back um, that slide with the prayer to Mother Mary Lang, and then I would love to open up the floor for any questions. Um, that you guys may have or comments that you, um, or clarifications even if you need some. So I'm gonna bring back a prayer. And you don't have to unmute your mic. Let's keep our mics muted for the time being, but please join me in praying um, for the canonization of Mother Mary Lane. So let's pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and eternal God, you granted Mother Mary Lang extraordinary trust in your providence. You endowed her with humility, courage, holiness, and an extraordinary sense of service to the poor and the sick. You enabled her to found the Oblate Sisters of Providence and provided educational, social, and spiritual ministry, especially to African-American community. Mother Mary Lang's love for all enabled her to see Christ in each person and the pain of prejudice and racial hatred never blurred that vision. Uh, Dane to raise her to the highest honors of the altar in order that through her intercession, more souls may come to a deeper understanding and more fervent love of you. Heavenly Father, glorify your heart by granting also this favor, the canonization of Mother Mary Lang which we ask through the intercession of your servant, Mother Mary Lane. We pray, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So I'm gonna come back to you all and um, open up the floor. I don't know if John would like to moderate questions or how, how we would like to tackle that. Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to do that. We can start in the chat um, and as usual, if you'd prefer to put your questions in the chat, I'm happy to moderate, or you can uh, simply unmute yourself. But we have one question from Angie Coffey. Uh, Paige, is there a Lenten Bible series you recommend this Lenten season? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and off the top, I mean, I, I hate to do the shameless plug again for my book, but I, I did do a, a Stations of the Cross um, for racism. Um, so that's what I know off the top of my head. Um, as far book wise, um, I do know if you know, and I'm, I'm blanking on his last name, but there's a father, Josh out of New Orleans, who has also done a rosary for uh, an anti racism rosary. Um, so I would highly recommend um, those two resources for sure. But as far as like a specific um, Linton study, I don't know of one off the top of my head. Other questions? Oh, I have a quick question. Um, well, appreciate your work, by the way. I really need to read your book. I had no idea until today, but um, uh, I've heard a lot of different, what's your opinion on regarding um, a lot of these pleas for not just reparations, but like 
massive investments to ensure that there isn't erasure in the Black Catholic history and Black Catholic Church. Uh, there's like a series of articles that came out that like in like other areas, the growth rate will slip because there we're not because parishes and suburbs that are mainly white are getting funds, but not. And then like, so I guess it's like a two-bar question. Do you think there's we should have these these seriousness, and then do we need to re like what can we do to prevent the eraser and slip it? I guess you could say slippers of history and culture. Yeah. By telling black history. I think that's an excellent uh, question and observation. I mean, I know re re reparations is a hot topic I, <laughs> issue, but you know, to be frank, I think we need to be very serious about reparations in both the political and the, the religious sphere. And here's why. It goes back to the, the compensatory aspect is that if you think about, especially the fact that black Americans were denied basic um, their basic rights as American citizens for so long. And especially if you look at housing, housing is the biggest indicator of that, right? If you don't know about redlining, um, you need to write it down and you need to Google it, right? Redlining is one of the hugest issues in our country of why black persons are stuck in low income housing um, or public housing. It's not, it, there's a fallacy about it being because of drug use, et cetera, et cetera. What it is, is quite simply, be, it was written into government housing to exclude black persons from um, FHA loans early in, um, in American history. So anyway, there are so many aspects through which it was literally written into the American legal system to exclude black persons from certain resources that are necessary for life. And so, to think that all of a sudden we can overcome that without going back and compensating for that, I think is is um, just inaccurate. And especially in the context of our Catholic church, I think we need to look at our schools, just like you were mentioning. I think that there were actually a very concerted effort in the past um, to make like the fund for the Indian Mission Fund to, to fund black um, scholarships, to fund Hispanic and Latino scholarships, to fund Asian American scholarships. And we need to be more serious about that because how, how do we expect all of a sudden for black persons to afford a Catholic education? And can we say that actually any Catholic person isn't a Catholic education their birthright? And shouldn't we be doing a little bit better job about making that accessible and affordable? Um, and so again, I think I, well, one thing I really love about that question is it really demonstrates how reparations or these compensatory actions that we can really make for black persons are mutually beneficial. They benefit everyone and we need to, to make, communicate that in conversations. So um, again, to go back to even a concept of reparations, Gloria Purvis does an excellent job talking about this and how it can be done. People speak about how they're afraid that any sort of reparations will greatly damage like our economy and it'll throw us into this great depression, et cetera, et cetera simply not true. There are models that have been done and that show that it's actually fiscally responsible and there's simple measures that can be done and education um, can be a focal point. Gloria Purvis had suggested that, you know, how, how about college loan forgiveness for Black Americans? That would not send us into a huge recession. That would be a significant reparation. Okay, so there are things that we could do that make good sense and again, this is where we need allies of European descent to echo this theme, because when Black persons speak about reparations, unfortunately, most people do not take us seriously. But if we are going to make some traction and to have some change in a, in a greater um, national impact, I 100% believe we need reparations. Uh, thank you very much for that response. And I know that some some of the folks in the room were present last fall when Mrs. Linda Wynn came and talked about the construction of I-40 as sort of a paradigmatic instance in our, our city of redlining. Um, and many of the folks here have also read uh, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, oh, uh, another seminal text. But if you haven't read that, uh, folks, um, it's long but readable. Um, uh, a few questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll open it up to um, someone who wants to uh, unmute and speak first before I read those. Okay, I'd like to ask you, what do you think of the um, 
two pastoral letters that the bishops wrote on racism. I know uh, Massingdale was kind of critical, uh, particularly the first one, and I'm not sure as much on the second one, but I'm just curious about, you know, what your thoughts are on those uh, bishops' letters, the U.S. bishops' letters about racism. Right. To be honest, I've only read the little snippets and I've entered in a conversation. I haven't read the whole, um, the whole letter, so I, I can't really speak to that, but I think that it's, it's hard because um, I think that the USCCB just is, is so deeply criticized. And I think that the letters are at least like, I'm, I'm just mindful of, especially in the past, um, when, when black Catholic bishops have written letters in communion with um, the USCCB, they're never even read. And so I think if nothing else to, to bring to the forefront of the fact that our bishops are engaging with this issue and that we need to, um, I think actually letters like that should be, we should have done a better job of like of reading them in our parish, right? Um, and yeah. so I think part of it is just the ignorance that I myself don't even know mm -hmm. half of what they're said, but I think it just goes back to this concept though of, you know, even when John Paul II came to visit America back when he was alive, our bishops actually pointed, asked him to speak to racism. And, uh, and he mentioned in his homily in St. Louis, he called out racism as one, uh, the sin of our nation. You know, and a lot of people don't know that even about John Paul II. So I think that our bishops um, at level one are at least doing a good job engaging the issue and calling out the sin. But I think we just all need to be a little bit more serious about the action points of how is our church falling short and what are the concrete items that we can do to move forward? Well, I think your observation about that just does not get filtered down. And I know of, I don't really know of any parish that has actually uh, been even alerted to the study of the letters and the study of any of the social documents. Mm -hmm. And it, it is very frustrating to me. I, agree. I know of one. <laughs> well, I, will do, I will do my homework and, and engage the letter more deeply myself. Could, could I make a comment and sort of a question building on Irene's? Um, last week after Deacon Hill's talk, I just happened to Google how many Blacks are Catholic bishops. And it's like five, maybe six. And only one is a full bishop, I think. The rest are auxiliary bishops. And it seems to me that until we start having black bishops in significant numbers, say 13% of the American bishops. One is a cardinal now, Archbishop right. Gregory. Right. Thank right. God. <laughs> But, but for lots of reasons, <laughs> you know, but but so that makes how do we institutionally deal when, in fact, we don't have the leadership that we should have? Right. But, you know, to, to kind of um, answer that question and, and play devil, devil's advocate, though, I think that does also go back, though, to the challenge of making everyone an ally. Like, yes, ideally. Um, I, in general, the priesthood, right, should be, have more Black representation, more Hispanic, Latino, Asian representation, period. And so what that, what that means is we need to do a better job of evangelizing. And what that means is we need to do a better job opening up the doors of our churches and our schools to persons of color, period. And that's level one of actually bringing about that change. Even with Cardinal Gregory, he converted at a Catholic school. Right. So we have to really understand what happens when we open up the doors of our schools to persons of colors. And we haven't adequately done that. that. To me, that's step one. But I think step two is, yes, it would be beautiful if we had more black bishops and cardinals. But wouldn't it even also be beautiful if our bishops and cardinals of European descent were more seriously working on this? Right. And I think we can do both. It's kind of that both and Catholic concept is yes, we need to open wide the doors of schools and churches so we have more black priests, black bishops, black cardinals, but we also then need to, um, again, just tap into the resources of what our bishops have done 
and then actually figure out how we can engage our bishops to do the work that they can do, those who are already there. Paige, um, we, we just watched the last two nights, the four hours of the Black Church and PBS. Um, and I, I was just struck how there was the word Catholic never was used all four hours of the history of Black Church. And I, I'm struggling with that. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, the first, the first thing that comes to mind, but it's a weak understanding, is, well, as they talked about Black Church, essentially they talked about independent Black churches, churches right. that separated from the Methodist Church, that separated, et cetera. But, but I was, I'm, I'm just struck that somehow in that tremendous history of the Black Church for the United States, that Catholic is not included. Right. Um, I, I wonder if you have any comment on that, because I'm, I'm yeah. struggling with that. Sure, um, I do. I have actually a lot of thoughts on that. I'm not familiar with that series. So first of all, thank you for mentioning that. I'm going to have to see if there's any way um, I can get it in hindsight. But this is what I will say. I wonder if um, there is a backlash in a lot of anti-racist communities against the Catholic Church. Um, and the reason is because, um, and especially in the in the um, book about anti-racism, the author goes to great lengths to talk about how um, white supremacy thrives when um, minorities are disproportionately represented, especially in in religious contexts. And so th this is this is something that I struggle with too, because this is why I shift my conversations to the faith. Because unfortunately, when in some of these political conversations, um, religion does sometimes get attacked or the Catholic Church gets attacked wholesale um, simply because of the disproportionate representation. So to go back to that PBS special, even though it was overtly about churches, I imagine some producer or someone somewhere ha probably had a bias against the Catholic Church knowing that black persons are underrepresented in the Catholic church. Yeah, I, so, I'm not sure about that. Um, the, uh, Henry Gates was the producer and he's, he's very prominent. I, I, I think, I mean, I, it may be, you may, you may well be right. But one of the words that was not allowed was the plural, churches. Hmm. The, the focus was black church. And um, even though there, you know, obviously several uh, instances of black church, but ca the Catholic was never mentioned as an instance of black church. Right. Well, if, if we're going to, then you have to think about how do we define black church? Because if we're going to define black church, then I could understand from a different angle too. So think about it this way. And this actually gets back to um, Cyprian Davis's book, post Post Civil War in Reconstruction, what we have is the development of the black church, where in Protestant um, and the Protestant understanding, right, that anyone who studies Bible can make church, and that's what happened um, in emancipated communities was Black leaders rose up from starting their own church, and that's how Black persons actually were educated, et cetera, et cetera, was through that church community, and obviously fast forward to Dr. King and really using the Black Protestant church as the training ground for civil rights. So if you're going to think about Black church in America, Historically speaking, it is Protestant. Um, and so I maybe that's the angle they were going for. But, you know, a lot of work could be done to speak more about, you know, like the Father Hesburgh and the other people who were right there with Dr. King and were making strides to unify and, and really integrate Black um, or integrate Catholic spaces. But if you're going to think about Black church, especially in a civil rights concept, um, you know, I could see how it's going to focus on a Protestant context. A uh, question from the chat. Uh, Robbie and Mike Pinter ask, uh, in your work with college students, what have you seen that concerns you? And what have you seen that gives you hope and encouragement? Oh, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I just have to shout out to the Pinters because I, I love to miss them. Um, but also, um, you know, there's division from our society that's seeping into all Catholic spaces. And that's what, that is what gives me 
um, a certain amount of sadness. I see a lot of debate with my college students of just shifting into the liberal and the conservative camps and, and just like viciously debating and, and losing um, sight of Catholic identity. So um, that's the part that saddens me. The part that encourages me though, is that the student leaders are very serious about enacting change. And um, our diocesan group, University Catholic had its own series of town halls and they have their own um, set of action points that they're initiating. And actually the work I'm doing um, tonight actually is bringing a group of FIST students to our cathedral mass for college students. So we're, in, we're doing, um, some very concerted efforts to make sure that we include our HBCUs, our historically black colleges and universities we have right here in our backyard. The students are very serious about engaging um, those. So I'm hopeful um, in that regard, but I think, you know, what makes me sad, I would caution everybody against is obviously we're welcome and free to have our political camps, but um, when we allow that to seep into our Catholic identity, I really believe that the devil takes root and divides us in ways that we ought not be divided. Uh, with reference to uh, Bob Gorman's question, um, I was an assistant pastor in Chicago of a Franciscan parish, and uh, there were about a dozen very vibrant churches. Um, we had two masses on Sunday, and they were packed, and that was Corpus Christi Church, the biggest uh, black church in Chicago. And they were they were packed, but but now I just learned that uh, in July, uh, all of those what I don't know how many ten or dozen uh, churches will close, and only uh, two two uh, parishes black parishes will stay uh, uh, or churches will operate and uh, ask all the people to you know go to those churches. So I'm thinking maybe the the black uh, people are are starting to uh, evaporate I, I don't know uh, that that that's a bad sign and uh, I, I had a classmate I, I was my Franciscan uh, uh, seminary had 360 people in the seminary only two in all those 14 years I was in seminary only two of them were black one one was a saint Ben Spivey from Chicago and he died pretty young the other one was my classmate Jim Like, who became the Archbishop of uh, Atlanta, and uh, and he died young. <laughs> but uh, I I think that um, there, there's a scarcity probably of, of black Catholics for, for 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 articles about the black church. When I hear the black church, I think I don't think of the Catholic church very much. I I, I think of the, the vibrant you know black parishes I've I've been to to funerals mostly. <laughs> And um, so I, 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 I just don't know what, if, that, if that isn't part of the problem. There's not enough right. black people. Right, well, it's, I mean, that's a, it's a huge topic. I can, I can enter in just a little bit. You know, there's, there's a lot of discussion of why black Catholic churches are closing. And I think part of it is, is kind of this also debate of like assimilation. Is it good news if, black persons are entering into other parishes um, and, and making those parishes more integrated. You know, I think that's debatable and I think that's that's something that to think about. But um, there's also always been the discussion of like the black Catholic right, right? Like, can there be a right within the Catholic church for black persons that emphasizes, again, those cultural gifts like gospel music without, you know, any sort of... Um, you know, with fidelity to the magisterium and to the mass, but just integrating um, aspects of Black culture. And there's been a lot of discussion about how that could lead to revival with Black Catholic churches. Um, and we have to think about our own St. Vincent's here in North Nashville. You know, there is a gospel mass at St. Vincent's, even without a, a, a Black Catholic rite um, that's totally licit. And, and so there are vibrant Black Catholic communities that are still, you know, making their gifts pronounced. But the, the other question we have to ask, it kind of actually pivots back to that point about reparations is where are the resources for those communities? And I think that's the reason why most of them are shutting down is for a lack of resources. And so we haven't given, I think the support that enables parishes like that to flourish. Um, and so I think that there could be an argument for that, um, especially if nothing else there, it could be very easy to have gospel mass at any parish. 
And that's something that I think we could look more seriously into as well. I'm gonna pause here. Um, <laughs> I know we're at 11.30 and I wanna give folks an opportunity to sort of formally say, I have to go goodbye. Um, but also, uh, Paige Courtney, for as long as you're willing to, to hang out and answer questions, um, we'll provide that. So let this be our opportunity to collectively uh, thank our speaker today for offering her wisdom. Um, I'm picking up a vibe in the room that we just must have her back uh, soon <laughs> um, to talk more about this. But thank you so much uh, for thank you guys. sharing <laughs> Um, so a real quick plug again for um, next Sunday, uh, Deacon Bill Hill will be back to talk about desegregation, um, specifically the desegregation of Nashville's Catholic schools and his experiences around those. Um, and then our final session in this series will be the town hall meeting on Thursday, March 4th, where we can talk about our collected experiences of these and other conversations we've been having and find some very concrete and practical ways to take that next step. Um, John, if we are not a member of Christ the King but wanna be at that town hall, is that okay? Uh, I'll talk to the guy in charge, he'll let you okay. in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all good. Um, so if you need to go, thank you so much. Otherwise hang out and uh, maybe we'll have a little bit of time for some more questions. One of the observations that I've had